we're all here today uh, because we really believe that a lot of the future of health among our membership, in our communities, and in the healthcare system uh, depends upon behavior change. All right, so we're all here because we actually think in one way or another there's a magic pill coming, and it's not going to come from the drug companies, though there are many, many marvelous contributions that are going to come that way. It's not going to come from genomics, although there's a lot of foundational research being done that will transform healthcare. But I think the magic pill that we're interested in is this health behavior change. And you've already seen and are well familiar with the data that it affects health status, medical utilization costs, productivity, health disparities. But here's one twist I'd like to present to you. You've all been in the meetings where Kaiser Permanente is celebrated and praised for our accomplishments in quality. And we deserve a lot of credit for that. And I think the curves are widening between our ability to deliver quality and many of the other systems in the community. At the same time, when I think about almost all of our quality measures, at the end of the day, they rely on a behavior change made not by us, but by our members. And that is, it's our members who decide to get preventive services. It's our members who come in for pap smears and mammograms, who return the fit kits that we mail to them. It's our members who take the prescribed medications that actually wind up showing up in better health outcomes, quality indicators. And it's our members who are really making the decisions that drive cost and quality in terms of deciding to come in for a particular symptom, to self-treat, or to come in too late when it's more costly and difficult to manage. And it's our members in terms of overall health promotion from self-management of chronic disease to exercise, diet, smoking, stress management, and so on. So the bottom line for me is while we congratulate ourselves, one of the things we ought to congratulate ourselves is having the most engaged, most educated members of a healthcare system. Patient behavior drives most of the outcomes, and I think our members and patients deserve some of the credit because most of the quality measures really depend on them. This is a wonderful report uh, that came out from Ernst and Young, who are really business analysts. And they said, changing behaviors represents the single biggest opportunity to improve health outcomes while bringing costs under control. And I think that's part of the belief that brings us together. Here's the problem. It's not easy to change behavior. Give it to me straight, doc. How long do I have to ignore your advice? And as a practicing clinician, I know what this feels like. I know that that can be very, very frustrating. I tell them to do the right thing. They just won't do it. And, you know, when I self-reflect a little bit, maybe I'm not doing all the things I might recommend to my patients either. And it's very frustrating to patients to have repeated failure experiences. And the patients are really saying, well, don't tell me what. I know what. Tell me how. You know, I'd like to do this. It's just I've had so many failure experiences. So we're going to focus a lot on the how of behavior change. And finally, here's a conversation between a doctor and a patient. And it says, there's no improvement, Henry. Are you sure you've given up everything you enjoy? You know, sometimes I feel like I'm practicing medical terrorism. That is, you know, if there's any outbreak of a patient doing something that's enjoyable or fun, I'll find some reason it's bad for their health, bad for their heart, bad for the lab test results, uh, or at minimum, it's fattening. So how do we reframe that? And this is the problem is most of our models of education, including a lot of what I'm going to do now, are disengaging. It's like expert up here is going to tell people who know nothing, a patient, colleagues, whatever, about how to do it the right way. And I guess what I want to actually start off and just say is when it comes to behavior change, lots of theories, lots of science, lots of evidence, 
And as far as I can tell, no one has found the Holy Grail uh, in this area. And so it's a process of our discovery and our co-discovery. First of all, when you made that change, raise your hand if you wrote out a specific plan and broke it down into very small steps. Raise your hand. Okay. Did a major life event or an epiphany or a breakthrough lead to the change that you made? Would you raise your hand? Okay. Did you change because your environment either required that you change or just made it really easy for you to make the change? Raise your hand. Okay. Did you change just because it felt good and you just did it without a lot of plotting, without a great epiphany, and without huge environmental redesign. How many of you did it that way? OK. So I think this is really curious, because when we design for change, where do we spend most of the time and effort? When you change, you don't do it that way. OK? When you change, you don't necessarily write out your plan and break it down into small, specific steps and so on. So there's a whole lot of change going on related to health, and there are many pathways to change. So first of all, my favorite way to change is pleasurable change. And that is, we evolved over millions of years to seek out certain things that are pleasurable, avoid other things because they were potentially toxic. And in seeking out things that were pleasurable, they were often good in terms of improving or promoting our health. And they were intrinsically rewarding, reinforcing, and we just did them and continued often to do them. Second is breakthrough change. And I want to say, I think this is the type of change we understand the least about. We all have known, either in ourselves, our families, or patients that we work with, they'll hit a life crisis. They'll hit bottom. They'll have the major heart attack, something. And suddenly, without a lot of plotting, planning, they change massive things in their lives. Similarly, it can be a positive experience. I walked in to see a patient. He was sitting there. He had a smile on his face. Everything was different. I don't know. He was exercising. He had changed his diet. And so I said, you know, it's not like we hadn't tried to do these things together. I said, what's your secret? And he smiled and he said, I fell in love. I want to bottle that. I want to put it in the pharmacies. I want it on the formulary. Because the breakthrough can come from very positive experience. The birth of a child, for example, pregnancy, often leads to a lot of changes. And those changes are often breakthrough changes. Then there's environmental change. And I want to recommend to you a book, Switch. How many of you have read Switch by the Heath brothers? Highly recommend it. I knew a lot of the stuff in Switch, but what I loved is there's a whole stream of behavior change in there, which is about clearing the path, making the change easier, changing the environment to support the change. And I want to say that uh, this is an extraordinarily important thing for us to do, because we are constantly taking our cues from the not only physical environment, but the social environment, what we consider normative. When it becomes normative to do instant recess, you just do it because that's part of the culture. That's part of the way we behave. And then finally, there's incremental behavior change, right? That's the baby steps, small steps, simple steps, tiny steps, starter steps, success steps. That's the one you use least. But that's the one we're going to concentrate on. Because some of the, uh, a lot of our effort still goes into helping set people up for success experiences by breaking down big changes into very small changes. The other thing I just want to tell you is sometimes the environment itself doesn't have to change. What changes our perception of the environment. And I'm going to take a minute to tell you about one of the best examples I can think of this is a very simple exercise called the gratitude exercise. Have you heard of this? Has anybody tried it? OK. There's studies now that show that you can measurably improve health outcomes 
as well as happiness and life satisfaction, if you do a simple exercise at the end of the day, you sit down and write down three to five things that happened during that 24 hours that you're grateful for. Okay? Now, I tried the exercise and I, you know, was pleasantly surprised that while I'm writing and thinking about the things I'm grateful for, of course I'm going to feel in a good mood. What I had not anticipated is what it does through the rest of the 24 hours. You see, tonight, I'm going to face a blank sheet of paper. And I have to come up with three to five things that happened during this day that I'm grateful for. I'm getting a little nervous. We're already at 11 o'clock. Have I found anything yet? Okay. So suddenly, my antenna go up. I begin to filter my environment, my experience, and uh, the people around me to discover and identify the things I'm grateful for. And so the environment hasn't changed. These things have been going on every day, all the time. What's changed is my cognitive frame and the way I perceive the environment. And so a very important way to approach environmental change is actually by changing people's conception of the environment. I have a friend, Nancy Bruning, who's written a book, 50 Things You Can Do on a Park Bench. I love that title. Isn't that a great title? 50 things. And suddenly, I can't walk by a park bench without thinking and looking at that park bench in a different way. These changes in cognitive frame are extremely powerful. I went to buy a car. This was some years ago. And the guy said, well, what else are you looking at? And I told him I was looking at this Chevrolet or something. And he suddenly stopped and he looked at me. He says, you know, the problem with that is nobody under the age of 50 should buy that car. Now, I knew what he was doing. He was manipulating me towards selling his car. But I've got to tell you, we're 30 years later. I cannot get that thought out of my mind. I now look at the Chevrolet and I'm going, even, you know, I'm over 50. I could buy it now. But I'm looking at that car and I'm thinking, I can't buy that car. <laughs> it, this framing and allowing people to see the world differently is an underutilized, and I'm going to come back to that, in terms of supporting behavior change. This is an instant focus group we're going to do. What is the baby in baby steps? How many, you've heard the term baby steps. You've probably even used it. OK. Is that empowering, inspiring, and engaging? That's A. Or is it patronizing, condescending, and a little bit insulting? So let's do an A-B test right now. How many of you think A? Raise your hand on baby steps. OK. How many think B? Uh-huh, okay. So we need to do a little research on how we label and frame these. Because if I say to a patient, I really want you to take baby steps, that actually is a, feels to me a little condescending. It, it's not inspiring to them. Baby steps, no, I want to take a big leap in improvement. All right, so do you prefer baby steps, we did, or simple steps, small steps, tiny steps, and so on? And I think we have to be very aware of our language because to the degree that we talk with our patients, our members, and so on about baby steps, we may have an opportunity. But if we're going to talk about small steps, I'm going to present something that is her heretical. What if the small steps do not lead to sustained behavior change and ongoing habits? What if? Oh, my God. Sh shall we give up our work? Uh, is it all for naught? Because the holy grail, OK, among behavior change is how do I get people to change, and how do I get them to sustain that change in an ongoing way? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that it's not a complete failure if people change, and then they change something else, and then they change something else and the changes aren't sustained. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to tell you a story, a story of uh, Mullah Nasruddin. And Nasruddin is a Middle Eastern teacher, joke figure, every man. And many stories are told about Nasruddin. Now, in this story, Nasruddin 
was a smuggler and a very, very good smuggler. He got richer and richer, and he would cross the border, and the border guards would go nuts. They, every time he came across, they would unload his donkey. They would take all the sacks apart. They'd almost strip search him. They'd look in his turban. They could never find out what Nazardine was smuggling. And years later, he retired, and he was sitting in a small caravanserai, and one of the border guards came in and was sipping tea with him and said, Nazardine, we know you're a successful smuggler. We never caught you. What were you smuggling? And what did Nazardine say? Donkeys. Donkeys. And the reason I say that is <clears throat> we really want to change behavior, and we are looking for the jewels and the contraband and the exercise and the diet, addiction, medication, adherence, smoking, and so on. And sometimes we so overload behavior change that we miss that where some of the real value is, is actually in the success and process of changing behavior. Namely, how does behavior affect health? Well, there are direct effects. And yes, we all want our members and patients to exercise more, to follow a diet, smoking, medication adherence, and so on. But there's also indirect effects of successful behavior change, namely enhanced mood and confidence. And in fact, I got started on this because I read a study in 1989 that stuck for me. This was about the arthritis self-management program by Kate Lorig, and later I got to work with Kate and develop the chronic disease self-management program. But the surprising finding is the people who went through this program had improved health outcomes. And when they tried to show the association between changing their behavior and the improved health outcomes, the Stanford statisticians, huge database, came up with, we we're able to demonstrate only weak, if any, actually, associations between change in behavior and change in health status. I was blown away by that because my, you know, my whole focus of my work was, was trying to get people to change their behavior, and yet health outcome was improving, and it wasn't explained by the behavior change. So you go to the people in the groups and you say, why did you get better? And they said, I felt more confident. I felt more in control. And you go to the people who didn't get better, and they say, it doesn't matter if I change my behavior. I feel hopeless, helpless, and not in control. The primary predictor of the improvement of health status was not the behavior change, but it was feelings of confidence and in control. And since they were at Stanford and Al Bandura is a psychologist there, it was called self-efficacy. And that's actually some of the earliest studies that were shown of the relationship and importance of self-efficacy with improved health outcomes. So I had the opportunity to work with Kate and the team down there on development of the chronic disease self-management program, which we've actually done a study of disseminating within Kaiser Permanente. And these are lay leaders who get together in small groups. The focus of it is increasing people's sense of confidence and control. I know this is strange. We don't care what behavior they choose to change or work on. It's irrelevant. What we care about is how do we help them identify something they want to change that they care about and break it down into a very small step that they are 70 to 80% confident they can have a success experience with and then celebrate that success. So what am I saying? Small steps can lead to sustained health habits like exercise, eating, smoking, preventive care, and that does lead to improved health. However, let's remember that small steps can also create a success experience, or as I've come to call it more recently, due to B.J. Fogg's work, success momentum. And that increases confidence, optimism, sense of control, and that itself can improve health outcomes. Does that make sense? But it's very different because I would ask you, what happens when we prescribe failure experiences for our patients? and our members? What happens when we set ourselves up for failure experiences ourselves? Well, there is a strong emerging literature as well. 
that shows that just a sense of confidence or a sense of happiness and well-being and positive mood is correlated with better health outcomes. Seven types of evidence are reviewed indicating high subjective well-being, like life satisfaction, optimism, positive emotions, is correlated with better health and longevity. Another example are happier people healthier. During the last four weeks, uh, have you been a happy person? Or all things considered, how satisfied are you with your lives? The answers to those questions actually predicts future health. People with higher satisfaction two years later, they report 50% better health than those who are not. And finally, do you know about the nun study? I love this. Okay, They studied nuns and the diaries of nuns during their training when they were in their 20s. And then 20, 30, 40 years later, they analyzed those. And the nuns who wrote in their diaries and autobiographies at a young age they wrote about happiness and joy and hope, had 2.5 less likelihood of dying than their gloomier counterparts. So not only do you get to lead a richer, more enjoyable life and thrive, but you also get to live longer. So behavior does matter. Please do not, I'm going to focus on behavior. Behavior really does matter. But also mind matters and mood matters. And those are ways to also improve behavior. All right, let me just show you how much mind and mood matters. If you look at depressive symptoms, this is sub-threshold depression. People don't even qualify for a diagnosis of depression. It has a bigger impact on physical and social functioning than many of the chronic illnesses that we really focus on and put our attention and resources on. I'm not saying ignore those medical problems, but when people are not thriving and they have this low level of depression, that actually affects their health almost as much or more than many of the chronic illnesses. All right, how do we prescribe uh, confidence and success spreading? Okay, so here's our donkey. And the question is, somebody comes in, they got problems in all those areas, you're gonna attack them all at once? Maybe not. There's a wonderful study out of New Zealand in which they encouraged people to exercise. They did not mention any other health or life outcome. They only focused on exercise. And what they found out is when you increase people's confidence in one area, in this case exercise, they notice that smoking goes down, alcohol goes down, perceived stress, procrastination, and they're eating healthier, they're keeping their appointments, they're studying better, and they can focus better. None of that was mentioned in the intervention. The focus was on increasing self-regulation or a person's sense of confidence in one domain and I think that there's hope that it can spread to other areas of behavior without ever having to directly address those. All right, so are people unmotivated? Hmm. Well, we have that attitude pretty prevalent within our healthcare system. And the consequences of that is we try to focus on motivation, get people pumped up, and increase their motivation. We also tend to prescribe for them lots of behavior change and create failure experiences for them. And then we become very frustrated because people won't change and very cynical. They're really unmotivated people and they don't know what's good for them. But a couple of questions. Do we really know what motivates people? Have we discovered that? Uh, how do we make it easier for people to do the things they already want to do that they're motivated to do? And have we really identified and celebrated the successes when they are successful at doing something? I think that's an antidote as we answer those questions to the usual approach we take to prescribing failure. So here's the question. We're all concerned about obesity. Where should we focus? Which part of the curve? Do you focus on that part of the curve, the most difficult, recalcitrant, difficult to change? Or 
do you focus on shifting the population curve where you have a lot of people who are ready and willing, they just want to know how. They just want, and my advice right now is if we just focused primarily, I don't say ignore other people, but focus on the people who are ready and willing and want to make a change and help make that change easier and more successful for them. We are likely to shift the population curve and get much more area under the curve than if we focused all our time and resources on the most difficult to change. Does it make sense? Okay. So what do people care about? I mean, we say they're unmotivated. So, you know, we come in and we're talking about preventive screenings and exercise and healthy diet. And when you survey people, what do they really care about? Well, I call it the three S's. They care about stress, they care about sex, and they care about sleep. Now, they're not unrelated to the other side, but in real life, okay, these are some of the primary concerns. In fact, a study was done of young Kaiser Permanente members, and they called these health hassles, okay? These are the things they don't think of going to the doctor for, but the things that are really bothering them, stress, sex, and sleep. So a study was done by ELISA, which is a IVR company. Uh, they do a lot of research on interactive voice response. And they surveyed about 1,000 people, and they kind of asked them, what are your major concerns? Okay, and interestingly enough, they find money concerns, unhealthy sex life, relationships, caregiver stress, job stress, diet, and exercise, okay? Now, I, I find that kind of interesting, okay? So where do we focus most of our attention? We focus it on diet and exercise. And what are they concerned about? And remember, we're calling them unmotivated, okay? But they may be motivated because of pressing concerns in these other areas. So what does that suggest to us? It suggests that our interventions, if they're going to engage people, also need to address some of the areas of stress, sex, sleep, with behavioral and health coaching type interventions and other things that we could do. I'm not saying ignore it. And the other thing is, we call them unmotivated, and then we dump on them 100,000 things to do and overwhelm them. So for example, uh, Montori has done a wonderful thing called minimally disruptive medicine. If you haven't heard this, go search YouTube for minimally disruptive medicine. There's a wonderful little video in which he talks about, you take somebody who's kind of demoralized, coming into the healthcare system, they're overwhelmed with stress, they got teenage daughters, uh, job is not going well, and so on, and we say to them, here are the 15 things we want you to do to manage your diabetes, okay? And we have added to their burden. So for example, when they surveyed patients with type 2 diabetes, and they surveyed diabetes educators, and they asked them, what are all the things that a patient should be doing? And it would take about two hours a day more to do all those things the diabetes educators thought they should do. Well, what's wrong with that picture? Who has two hours extra? One of the major obstacles that most of the patients say back, I don't have enough time to do all that. And the implications are, we need to help prioritize, consider patient preferences, and really respect time and help guide them to the things that are likely to have the highest payoff. We need to be far, far more engaging. We are boring. Now, Thrive has come along, and I have to say, that has been really exciting. It's like the organization went from black and white to color within a couple of years, it's like the TV got turned on. But by and large, when you look at what we have done in terms of behavioral interventions and health education, we're pretty boring. Why should I be tested for colorectal cancer screening? Now, I, I just, I mean, I just want to tell you, because that came out of my department and so on, what are we up against? What are we competing with? We're competing with this, okay? Now, if I were doing one of those psychological studies where I could measure your eye tracking movements, 
My guess is you're probably more engaged by what's going on on the right-hand side of the screen than the left-hand side of the screen. Now, I don't think we can go as far right as that, OK? But couldn't we be a little more engaging and a little less boring? Well, let me give you an example of something that we really want to try. Maybe a little more lighthearted. I was asked to consult on the redesign of letters going out to patients from their physician to remind them to get their lab test results, you know, if they had high cholesterol or diabetes and so on. And uh, we revised the letters. We used principles of social influence and made each letter stronger and more directive and whatever. And I said, you know, it strikes me if people have gotten the second letter, sending them another letter of the same ilk is not likely to engage them. So couldn't we try something different? So uh, we're drafting this and may try to test it. Hi, David. This is your heart checking in. It'd be great if we can get an update on our cholesterol levels and blood sugars. To be honest, I'm not really sure I know how well we're doing. And by the way, I also heard from your kidneys. And they're asking for a lab update, too. Dr. XYZ has already ordered some routine tests, and they're waiting for us at any Kaiser lab. When do you think you might meet me there? Today? This week? And I think I know the results could help keep my arteries open and keep you feeling well and keep us on the right place. Now, I don't know if this is going to work. It's testable, though. I'm fairly certain that the third form letter from your doctor is not going to work. And what if this turns off some patients? Well, those are the ones who probably came in on the first or second one anyway. And if you can just not. We need to make this a little bit more fun. But the other thing is, this is actually a behaviorally designed intervention. What do I mean? Well. There are principles of influence, like the ones Cialdini has done. And this uses the authority principle, because it is signed by their doctor. It uses social proof, and I'll show you that in a moment. And it also uses consistency. And that is, people tend to be consistent with their image of themselves or their previous behavior. So how does this work? Here's another example. Set completion. Okay. We like things to be complete. So for example, there's a wonderful example of a, you go to a car wash, and they give you a ticket that says if you get 10 car washes, you get a free one. And then they tested that against giving people the ticket with 12 slots on it, and they put two punches in the first two and said, you're already on your way. You've got two. We've got you started. Well, people like to finish the set, and they also really like the idea. They've already accomplished it. I hardly want to throw away my credit for two car washes. I'm the kind of person who's going to finish this. Now, how does this work? So for example, what if we're sending out a reminder to patients who are unmotivated, right, uh, to get preventive screening? Congratulations on getting your mammogram and your pap smear. You have only two gaps remaining to complete your preventive care. Check, check. Oh, colorectal flu. The majority of my patients are up to date. Please join them. When do you think you might complete your preventive care? Now, this is carefully designed to take advantage of principles of consistency. You're the kind of person who gets mammograms and pap smears. Why not be consistent and get the rest of your preventive services? Set completion to complete the set, social proof, that is, we look to other people and norms around us. The wonderful ad for Kaiser Permanente, which said, Kaiser Permanente women get mammograms. How powerful that is to normalize that that's what's expected. That's the norm. And finally, the authority principle, having it come from your doctor. So I guess what I'm saying is when we go to design our interventions, we're going to do more about this later. When we go to the cost of poorly designed messaging is at least the same in terms of paper, opportunity cost, time, printing, and so on, as a carefully constructed message. And in fact, a poorly constructed message will often discourage behavior and not get people to do some of the things that we want. 
And if you change the response rate just by a few percentage points, remember, that's shifting that curve, you can get a huge return on investment. And so we need to try these small uh, tests of change, iterate on them, change them, learn from them as we go ahead. And finally, how do we prescribe success? Well, the literature suggests there's a couple of ways. First of all, persuasion. And that is, if I say to you, gosh, you can do it. I have confidence in it. Go ahead, go forth, you can do it. Uh, that works, but it's the least powerful way of increasing a person's self-efficacy or confidence. Second is modeling. And that is when we see other people who we identify not superheroes, but real people like us. And we go, well, if they can do it, I can do it. And it increases confidence. So for example, when um, a person with cerebral palsy climbs uh, El Capitan, Wampler, Steve Wampler, I hear about it. I marvel at it. But it doesn't increase my confidence one bit that I can climb El Capitan. He's like in another league. He's a superhero. When I heard that my neighbor Joe, who's out there mowing the lawn, climbed El Capitan, I go, whoa. You know, he's like me. Maybe I could do it too. Cognitive reframing we talked about a little bit earlier is uh, in terms of the way we see our environment, the way we see ourselves, being able to shift that cognitive frame is very powerful. And finally, mastery experiences. And those are the small steps, simple steps. When you have those and you have success experiences, it builds your confidence. You're more likely to continue that or take on other challenges. So mastery experience. So I like to frame this about how do we prescribe failure? Because I think we, I have a master's degree in prescribing failure. I have graduate work. I, I've done 30 years of prescribing failure experiences for my son, for my wife, for my patients, and for myself. So let me share with you the ingredients of prescribing failure. First of all, make it prescribed. That is, tell someone else what they're supposed to do. Trust me, after the age of two, that usually builds resistance. <laughs> two, make it really general or global, not specific. Say. You know, you have to lose a lot of weight, OK? Three, make it pretty difficult, you know, really challenging. Four, make it long term. I'm not talking about now. I'm not talking about next week. We're talking about lifelong change here. And plus minus, make it pretty unpleasant to do. And I can almost guarantee you, you will have created a failure experience. Now, we don't really want to do that. And in fact, I think that's behavioral malpractice, but we do it all the time. You know, we're supposed to at least do no harm, but here we are prescribing failure. So how do we prescribe success? First of all, a person has to choose the behavior, OK? It has to be really personal to them. And I can't tell you what somebody else is going to choose. Two, it has to be really specific. And in the latter part of the workshop, we're going to get really crispy and specific on the behavior, not general. It has to be something easy to create a success experience. And usually, we use the confidence test. Are you 70 to 80% confident? Because if people are below that, chances are they're going to fail. And maybe they could reshape the goal or the step a little bit so that they're more confident. I like rapid change with rapid feedback. There's a wonderful book called 59 Seconds by Richard Wiseman. I recommend it to you. He was a psychologist, and one of his patients came to him and said, do I have to go through 20 years of psychotherapy before I can feel better? And he was challenged by that, and he went back through the literature and harvested a lot of the really rapid change techniques that can be used like the gratitude exercise and so on and pulled them together in a book. And I, to the degree that the change can be pl something pleasurable, sometimes it can, sometimes it can't. And then finally, we've got to celebrate success. And I'm going to illustrate that in a moment. I'm going to talk about trout. I'm going to talk about tide. 
and I'm going to talk about tires. Let's start with trout. Okay, so this is a patient of mine. Well, actually, it's not a patient of mine. Anybody know who that is? Paul Giamatti, yeah. Uh, for confidentiality purposes and HIPAA violations, I could not put my patient's picture there. But suffice it to say, he looked a lot like Paul Giamatti. <laughs> oh, I learned a good HIPAA joke. Knock, knock. Sure. Can't tell you. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so uh, Paul, is, uh, Paul um, is a patient of mine. I've been working with eight to 10 years. He's overweight. He's sedentary has diabetes type 2, has hypertension, hypercholesterolemia. When we test his hemoglobin A1c, which measures the control of his diabetes, it's usually about 10.2, sometimes after a lot of effort, 10.1, and so on. Now, uh, we'd like to have it 8 and below, 7 and below, depending upon his age and other risk factors. It's not good for his brain, it's not good for his heart, it's not good for his kidneys, it's not good for his legs. All right, it's not like I hadn't tried. I mean, I had tried motivational interviewing, brief negotiation, goal setting, couples counseling. I had tried, I even tried Jewish mother guilt induction. <laughs> this is a technique I learned at a very young age. I pulled out my quality scores, and I said, hemoglobin A1c, 10.1. You're pulling down my quality scores. Can you help me out here? If you won't do it for yourself, will you at least do it for me? Nothing was working. Finally, I said to him one day, what do you really enjoy? And I realized I was clueless about that. I had no idea. I could tell you his hemoglobin A1c. I could tell you where he worked. I could tell you how many children he had. I couldn't tell you what he really enjoyed because I thought he was unmotivated. And suddenly his whole face changed. He smiled and he said, trout fishing. I love standing out in the stream, casting. I don't care if I catch anything. I just love being out there. At that moment, and that was 30 seconds, at least four or five things changed. First of all, I realized that I didn't know this patient. I mean, how could I work with him for eight to 10 years and not understand something about his whole life apart from his diseases, social history, and so on? Number two is I had just done half the screening for depression, okay? That is, if he would have looked at me and said, there's nothing I enjoy, I cannot think of one thing I enjoy, then you have to think depression and finish the screening for depression. And we all know if the patient's depressed, their likelihood of changing all these behaviors and doing the disease management and so on is very, very unlikely. Third, I now understood that hemoglobin A1C didn't mean anything to him. Trout fishing meant everything. How could I connect hemoglobin A1C with keeping him out in the trout stream doing what he loves to do as long as possible. That became my clinical and communication challenge. And finally, and this is really interesting. You see, I'm in adult medicine practice, primary care. And most of my day is back pain, dizziness, headache, chest pain, mucus, diarrhea, shortness of breath, acting out teenage children, I mean, that's like my day. It's not a real cheery picture, to be honest. And for a moment, when I ask a patient this question, I get to be at, in a trout stream fishing. For a moment, I get to be repairing children's dolls and donating them to charity. For a moment, I get to be in a playground on a swing with a grandchild. For a moment, I get to be painting a 1967 cherry red Camaro and restoring it to pristine condition. You see, for a moment, it's a bright spot in my day. And it reconnects me with why I went into medicine. You see, I don't want my tombstone to say, he, he got great quality scores on hemoglobin A1C. That is not my life purpose and meaning. 
Hemoglobin A1C doesn't mean anything to me. Keeping people healthy with their legs on, with their eyesight and vision, so they can do the things they love and are passionate about, that makes me want to get up in the morning and go to work. So I see this as a way of also connecting passionately with what we are about as a healthcare organization. I had a patient who uh, was hypertensive and was not taking her antihypertensive medications. She knew she had the disease. She actually wanted to take it. Uh, that was all clear. She couldn't remember. So this, this, so what's my usual response? Take your medications, for God's sakes. Number two, provide a tsunami of solutions. Do you brush your teeth every day? Put it next to the toothbrush. Put a note on the refrigerator, and so on. And the patient will sit there and go, yes, doctor, which is the way a patient says no to you. You know, yes, doctor, whatever you say. And then they don't do any of those things. Or I paused for a moment. I said to her, oh, it sounds like you really want to take your medications. What do you think might help? Pause. Now, I've learned in the exam room, pausing is not like a life-threatening hemorrhage, OK? But we don't pause. She reflected for a moment to what she thought might work, and she said, tide. I'll put a note on the tide box. I do laundry every day. When I go out there, the box will remind me to take my medication. I said, that sounds like a fabulous solution. How confident are you that that'll work? 80 to 90 percent. I said, that's great. When I see you back, I want to find out how well the Tide solution worked for you. Now, here's a question. How long do you think it would have taken me to come up with the Tide solution? <laughs> I don't do laundry. I do windows on a computer. You know. The point is that often patient-generated solutions are much more likely to be successful. If she could have come up with nothing, first of all, screen for depression, OK? Because sometimes they can't come up with anything because things just look hopeless, and I can't think of anything. So you screen for depression. And the second thing is you say, well, my patients have come up with some other solutions. Would you like to hear any of them? So I'm not saying that it's all hands off, but it starts with, what do you think might work for you? Discovering their solutions. And finally, celebrate success. So a quick story. I took my car in for service. Nothing was wrong with it. Just needed an oil change. The service attendant walks around my car. He inspects the tires, the rims, and so on. He comes back to me. He says, you know, you have done a fabulous job of protecting your tires and rims. At this mileage, I would have expected to see a lot more wear and tear, nicks and scuff, marks on the rims. You've done a great job. Well, I got to tell you, he made me feel really good, OK? He made me feel good. I had done something. He had discovered something I had done that I had been successful in, and he had reinforced it and celebrated it with me. And he had changed my self-identity. Now, when I drive down the road, I'm going, I am a protector of tires and rims. <laughs> Careful, slow down around that corner. I don't want to wear out that tire. It's a change in conception and a celebration of success. So how do we engage people in successful change? Three tips for you. First of all, discover their passions. Find out what they really enjoy. Discover their solutions. That's the starting point. It's not necessarily the end point. And third tip is celebrate the success. You know, the rational part of our brain, and, and it took me a while to come to the word celebrate, it was acknowledge. Ugh, you know, no guts, no li life to it. It was praise, condescending, pretentious. Celebrate is a mutual activity, something you do together in relationship. And so I like celebrate success. Or, and that furthers this success momentum we'll talk about. So the bottom line on the presentation, this part one, if you will, 
There is a science to this. It's an incomplete science, but a science nonetheless, that we can harvest behavioral principles and integrate them into the messaging and the work we do. Number two is, for the most part, people are not unmotivated. They may be unmotivated to our priorities and what we want them to do, but nine times out of 10, we don't know what motivates and animates them or how to link to that. And so discovering what they really enjoy, what animates and motivates them, is an important part of us addressing. And that health promotion doesn't have to be so prescriptive, boring, and dull. It, we can design for joy. Can you stand up for a moment? Has everybody seen this? This is a wonderful t-shirt. Look at that. Design for joy. Uh, we can design for joy. In fact, if I could borrow that, I may relabel the whole presentation, design for joy. Uh, and these are some of the principles that we can use in, in our very practical work and in self-prescribing for ourselves.